Hello and welcome to Star Citizen Sunday with me, Ryan, aka Super Messiah. This is a weekly show which covers everything from the world of Star Citizen over the past week. Links can be found in the description for everything we discuss, so let's get on with it. So this week's Star Citizen Sunday will be in two parts. Today, part one will feature 10th of the Chairman, the Crucible Concept Sale, the Repair Design Document and the Anniversary Sale. If you are still to sign up to the RSI website, please use my referral code as shown on screen or in the description and you'll receive 5,000 United Earth credits which can be spent in the Voyager Direct Store for your ships, your character or whatever you choose. You don't have to spend anything to sign up, it's only once you pledge that I'll be granted an RP point which will get me some little rewards in the future. I would like to give a huge thank you to all of our patrons, your support really allows us to create these videos. I have recently updated our Patreon rewards and goals to better reflect our direction. Things like Star Citizen package giveaways and private gaming sessions with me would be a good way to thank you all for helping the channel. Follow the Patreon link in the description if you would like to help. So as always we kick off with 10 for the Chairman, episode 70 this time. First question being, can I swap out my P-52 for a P-72, the Archimedes, on the base constellation? And they say they had just finished up with the P-72, which is going to be a racer. So you may have the ability to upgrade or buy it separate, but there's no final decision just yet. And it does sound like you will be able to dock it like the P-52 on the Constellation. Whether or not you'll need a separate adapter or a different dock, I do not know. Second question, will escape pods be functional in 2.0? And they say no, possibly for 2.1, but Chris does explain that later on, bigger multi-crew ships will have so many damaged states and lots of warnings before it explodes. So using a life pod would save your life, or one of your lives as you were. Uh, technically will have about nine of them, but you will get a state of alarms, sirens, lights and flashes and so forth, telling you what state your ship is in before it explodes. So it's not just going to be an instant explosion like we see in Arena Commander at the moment. There will be warnings before it does go up. So moving on, with FPS armor currently revolving around light, medium and heavy suits, is there any plans to allow us to mix and match armor types and if so, how will the overall protection value be determined? Will it be location based? And Chris says that for the initial 2.0, it will just be the light, medium, heavy, which we know of. The position universe long term, which they are currently in the process of concepting now, will be in pieces so you can mix and match so you can have a breast, your shoulder guards, your legs, etc, etc. It will be hit location dependent and the strength of the material will determine, obviously, how far the bullet will impact. It possibly won't come with 2.1 as that will be fairly close to the launch of 2.0 but 2.2 is, is looking like the likely option there. I do like the armour idea. It's very much like how Fallout works now where you can put on your arm, your legs, different areas, your chest piece but the difference being is that they will make a difference where you put them. So if you have light armour on your shoulder, heavy on your leg, if you get shot on your leg, it will deflect the bullet a lot better than it would on the on the arm so next question will we be able to land on the crusader planet in 2.0 if so how close will it be to what we saw in the citizen con 2014 demo which is when they landed on art core and how close is this to your final vision he says that we don't have planetary landings on 2.0 it will all be on space stations next year we will get planetary landings he says and it will be like citizen con 2014 when they landed on art core but much better he did say, though, there's lots of cool stuff they're working on, but they cannot say yet. And I quote, he said, You will be doing something which we didn't think we would be doing for quite a while. Landing on planets will be more freeform from space to planet and will all stream. So all this tech that's coming together, it's, it's this sort of procedural generation of planets that they're, they're creating. Originally, it was quite an automated sequence from space into orbit or onto the planet. And you had no control over your ship, but you could freely walk around your ship. It sounds like there's going to be a lot more freedom to this. And if they're this close with a more freeform orbiting system, then the whole procedural generation of planets must be pretty close as well. Not obviously as close as this, but it's coming along quick since they opened this Foundry 42 in Frankfurt office. So fingers crossed, procedurally generated planets will be hopefully for the launch of the PU. Who knows? Anyway, next question. Will multi-crew ships be able to perform extreme manoeuvres causing blackouts or redouts? And if so, will the crew on board be thrown around the interior if unrestrained? And Chris says that in longer term, he would like this to be so. So you will be thrown around. He's that it's not going to be in 2.0, but it's not too difficult to implement. They just have more priorities 
than something like that. They will not allow larger ships to pull off more extreme manoeuvres, but you should be able to manoeuvre fairly violently, and if you do so, then things like loose boxes will be thrown around as well. So if they're not mag clamped to the area they're supposed to be, they could be a projectile, I suppose, so you've got to be careful. So second to last question, will there be voice commands for shortcuts? And he says, as we know, the community has voice profiles available now, which you can download and start using. Longer term, he says, it's absolutely on the audio roadmap to build a voice command. It will be something coming after the VoIP and situational 3D voice. For short term use, just use one of the community profiles. So final question, how will the star system's availability be in the PU release in regards to selecting a home planet? And he said it's a bit too early to make a call on the planets which will be available at the start. There will be a selection, but the quantity or where they are is not been thought out yet. Expect to see mainly UEE space systems, but they will allow more of a greater choice depending on the role you want to want to play. So a pirate would not necessarily want to be making home in UEE space. So there will be some more pirated areas as well, if you so choose. Anyway, that was 10 for the chairman. Some really good questions, and it's always great to see Chris back in the chair telling us the answers. Tell me your thoughts. So as you all know, during the anniversary live stream, they revealed the Anvil Crucible, which is to be the repair ship. Now this is nicknamed the Flying Toolbox, it is Anvil's first dedicated repair ship and it features a rotating control bridge and detachable pressurised workspace. It is a versatile mobile garage and equipped with repair arms. It has an operational centre and all equipment needed to overhaul a damaged craft. So whether you're restoring a crippled derelict or quickly getting a Hornet back into shape, it has everything you need. It features a series of remote manipulator arms for dedicated repair work, clamshell style doors, to allow for either zero G or pressurized repair work as well and tools and EVA equipment. So the cab is a carefully designed repair orientated bridge with multiple operation stations. A single captain can operate both the flight and repair control system by rotating the bridge, facing forward to fly, rotating to face backwards to look over the repair bay. Obviously with larger crews, you can divide each station up to an individual. The cab section features storage, living quarters and dedicated EVA lockers and EVA will be necessary for when you repair larger ships or for salvaging. Now the workstation is an area for future expansion so this is where we'll likely see the majority of the modules. It comes as standard with a scarab which is the garage. It is a dedicated dry workshop to support pressurized repair of single seat fighters or the external clamshell doors can open up in depressurization mode to allow work on larger ships. It has two internal arms for remote work and it is capable of servicing everything from a constellation up to a Bengal. Now the scarab or the garage can be dropped off in space and it will remain as a fully functional temporary station while the cab can perform other duties. So this is obviously the concept sale for it and it is offered for a first time as a limited concept sale. So it's going to cost $350 if you live in the US or if you live in the EU it'll be $420. Now a concept sale means that it's not ready to display in your hangar nor is it ready to fly in 2.0 or Arena Commander. It includes LTI, lifetime insurance on the hull, plus two decorative items for your hangar once they are ready. This includes the poster and the Takeyatsu model. The price will also be more expensive in the future and it will not include LTI. Now the sale ends on the 30th of November and as a disclaimer they say that this is purely to help fund Star Citizen development. It allows for the inclusion of deeper non-combat orientated features in the Star Citizen universe. It will be available for in-game currency. It is not required to start the game. Now the Crucible will be entering the ship pipeline now, but it will likely be released after other concept ships are completed. So the specs, it is 80 meters in length, has a 73 meter beam, and it is 16 meters in height. Its null cargo mass is 625,500 kilograms. It can carry 300 standard cargo units. The main thrusters and the weapons are still to be determined, but there are four of each. So as we heard in the live stream, with the release of the Crucible, they needed to explain how the repair and the maintenance of your ships will work. We've got a huge deep dive design document explaining how the whole system will work in depth and it is incredible. So it says the repair system will work in conjunction with the detailed damage module to create an intuitive and engaging gameplay that you will want to pursue as a career. Tools will be equipped with multi-purpose lasers that can trim away damaged material or center construction material injected onto the component frame rebuilding its structure. Any ship with repair capabilities has two roles. You've got repair arm operator and repair task manager. So the arm operator controls a robotic repair arm. It is mounted with a multi-purpose laser and material in 
injector system. It can carry out all manner of repair tasks and it is the only player controlled method to fully restore a ship to 100% but it requires skill, knowledge and coordination. Now the repair task manager, he relays detailed damage information to the arm operator. He designates repair tasks to be undertaken and he is responsible for the allocation of materials for part reconstruction. So the task manager must first use their damage assessment interface to gather damage info and prepare for the repair task required. When it comes to damage assessment, the task manager will use a terminal and can access the target ship's damage diagnostics. This will display the status of the ship parts, including hull, systems, weapons, etc. and all their connections. The player can then toggle and filter between various layers, isolating and displaying their respective elements. Damage dealt to ship hulls are displayed on the augmented reality overlay as a heat map. Green meaning no damage, red meaning full damage and then a gradient in between. Hull breach edges will also be highlighted. So highlighting various parts will display its current health and materials required to repair it. When ready to start, the task manager selects the desired part which opens the material panel. So with the material panel, repairs consume raw construction material which can be obtained either through mining, scavenging, or trading. Now the task manager can assign different materials according to the task at hand via their materials panel. Each job requires a specific type and quantity of material. When a component is selected the requirements are displayed in the repair compound section of the panel as slots needed to be filled from the repair ship's material stock. Each material is graded by how effective it is when assigned to a slot and it will affect the repair, but we'll get more onto that later. For optimal results, they say the task manager must balance the arm operator's requirements versus the value of the materials used. Once all materials have been assigned, the arm operator can then begin the reconstruction process. So when it comes to reconstructing, if a part or component is entirely destroyed or detached, it must be reconstructed. First, the task manager selects the missing part using their damage assessment panel and assigns the materials. Once a composition is confirmed, the missing parts frame is automatically reconstructed by the repair arm. It is completely automated using patterns from a terminal's database. After the framework is complete, the player can then use patching to build the surface up as normal. Before reconstruction can begin, the attachment point must be cleared of any debris by the arm operator. If debris is still present, the part appears as a red hologram on the damage assessment screen with highlighted debris to be removed. So for the repair arm operator, once the task manager has chosen the part and repair material, the arm operator starts the reconstruction and repair process. Using their terminal, the operation controls the arm's position and aim remotely via a mounted camera. The head is translated and aimed directly with an IK solution orientating the rest of the arm to follow. Repair arm lasers have two modes, stripping and patching. In stripping mode, the arm's high-powered laser is used to remove parts of the component surface without causing structural damage to the surrounding area. Strip surfaces are converted and collected as percentage of its raw material. Full reconstruction requires a clean attachment point requiring the operator to cut away any debris of that surface. When it comes to patching, it is the act of rebuilding a ship or component surface and restoring its integrity. In patching mode, the arm's laser is repurposed to directly print material onto a ship or component's frame. As the arm is aimed, a wireframe hologram is projected showing the edge of the damaged area that can be printed onto. The grid is a high resolution tractor mesh which matches the undamaged surface supporting the material printed onto the ship. The arm sprays a powdered compound whilst firing the laser to heat up and bind the compound creating the new surface. As the surface is built up the mesh contracts to form a new working edge until the area is completely restored. Strength of the new surface is dependent on the amount of exposure it is subjected to from the laser. If the laser focus remains on for too long the integrity decreases and the surface overheats. An operator needs to find the sweet spot in in order to achieve optimal integrity. Now the player can toggle the augmented reality heat map overlay whilst patching to receive real time feedback as they approach the threshold. When a surface turns green it nears 100% and transitions back to red if overexposed. Again if overexposed it will need to be restripped before reattempting using time and resources. The composition of the material defined by the task manager determines the behaviour of the patch surface, the maximum integrity level, the size of the peak integrity sweet spot and rate at which the exposure affects integrity. This presets a player defined risk reward loop where if skilled enough using cheaper materials can produce the same quality as expensive ones. You also need to take into consideration the operator's abilities when pricing up the job and assigning materials. 
So when it comes to field repairs, you get a personal multi-tool, which looks pretty cool. Someone pointed out it looks like the Halo sidearm. It has a smaller scale capability of the workshop's repair arm. It can achieve a wide variety of repairs, short of sort of full and part reconstruction. Although the multi-tool abilities are the same as the repair arm, the size of the laser and the low quality of materials it can store is only suitable for quick fixes and patch jobs, which will keep it going until you can get to a repair facility. Now, when it comes to component damage, when a ship takes damage, some of that damage will be transferred from the point of impact of the hull to the nearest systems and weapon components. Components then distribute the damage between itself and whatever subcomponents are attached inside. Subcomponents are the various consumables used to run or improve a component's system's behavior. Component field repairs consist of turning off whichever component is having problems, replacing the broken subcomponent, and then turning the component back on. In larger ships, or capital ships especially, there will be multiple actions in turning a component off and on, including rerouting the power or coolant to other parts of the ship. These actions may involve the use of an onboard computer. So when it comes to subcomponents, they provide additional benefits to components they are attached to. We can see the image. It allows for further customization, and as the image shows, it's divided into three categories, efficiency, protection, and emission. I'll leave that up there so you can all read it. Now, module racks, these are panels that house the various components used to keep the associate subcomponents running. They can be found on the hull under maintenance hatches for closed cockpit ships, and in the engineering section for multi-crew ships. Each subcomponent is built for quick removal removal and replacement allowing for field repairs to be quick. If a player attempts to remove a subcomponent from a powered component, they will risk electrocution. So always remember to turn it off and never stick that screwdriver in there. Replacing a damaged subcomponent is simple. It's just a case of interacting with the item in question. Once removed, it frees up the slot and then you can replace it with another item if you have one in your possession. Subcomponents are typically universal across the ships and same size components. For example, a coolant rod from a Gladius laser cannon can fit or replace a Hornet's coolant rod in their shield generator. This provides great flexibility and opens opportunity for scavenged parts as well. Very exciting. I do love that concept. The components on a ship such as an Idris or Retaliator can require a large number of subcomponents to function or even larger sized subcomponents. When damaged, more complicated systems can take significantly longer to diagnose and physically swap out. Ships can contain alternate backup systems and in an emergency, engineers can use their terminals to redirect power to the backup, keeping the ship functional while the engineers attempt to fix. Now it can be done manually as well should the terminal be damaged by swapping out the whole module rack and replacing the backup system in the primary slot. Now this adds most of the careers and the systems that they are putting into Star Citizen is extremely in depth and it is going to be a career path that I will enjoy taking, learning, getting better at it, earning some money in the verse. Tell me your thoughts. This is far more in depth than I ever thought it would be. I knew it would be, but I didn't know it would be this in depth. Anyway, tell me what you think. As you are probably aware, with the latest anniversary livestream came the inevitable anniversary sale. Every ship previously sold, barring perhaps larger ships, I believe anyway, will be available to purchase again. So far, they are going day by day with a set style of ships. Kicking off during the live stream, you are able to pick up the Crucible. You could also choose from any of the new Avenger variants, which we will cover in part two of Star Citizen Sunday, the P-72 Archimedes, and any Vanguard variants, which are now hangar ready as well. Plus, every day they release $1,030 Aurora starter packages. However, they do go extremely fast, and I've not actually been able to see any of them for sale. On Friday, we saw the Explorer ships, which means you could pick up either the Endeavour and its modules, or the Karak. Saturday was the Pirate ships, which included the Cutlass Black, Red or Blue, the Drake Caterpillar, and the Herald. There was also an Infamous pack, which included all the Cutlass variants, a Herald and a Caterpillar for $650. That is currently still on, but today we will see the military selection which will include the Retaliator and its modules, the Starfarer Gemini, the new Sabre and the Super Hornet. On Monday the 23rd, it will be the racing ship. Now this is the M50 and the 350R. It does say the Mustang Delta will be available, but I believe this will likely be the Gamma. On Tuesday the 24th, they will bring out the Alien ships, which include the Kartu Owl, the Banu Merchantman, which I know a lot of people want, and the Misk Reliant. Wednesday the 25th is the Working Starships, so you have the Reclaimer, the Starliner, the Orion, the Aurora LX and the Starfarer. Thursday will bring the Freelancer Miss, the Hull series and the Constellation Phoenix. And then finally, from Friday through to Sunday, all ships previously available during the sale will return. So be sure to pick up the ship or ships that you really want, otherwise you will have to wait a whole year again. On a quick side note, I just want to bring some attention to a Star Citizen community website called Redacted.tv. It's a great place to get all the news on Star Citizen and also check out some of the YouTubers or Twitch streamers. Highly recommend signing up. The link is in the description. 
So that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you for watching and thank you to our subscribers, plus a massive thank you to our patrons as you make this possible. If you like what we do and want to help us make it better, follow the link in the description to our Patreon page to learn more.